Barnhart, it's amazing to see you in a um, dynamic and interactive uh, format. I've been, I've been, I've watched now about sixty or seventy of your lectures on uh, on the uh, Great Courses series. Thank you for that, and welcome. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. All right. So, um, we, you're you're a Mayanist. Among other things, yes. That's, yes, that's, that's, that's kind of how you started at, at UTI. <laughs> and you've been, you've been down there and you've measured pyramids. You're a surveyor. That's the bulk of the work that I've done down there in the field. I, I am a, a mapper and explorer. And yes, surveys, the technique we use to get it out of the jungle. Yeah, I, I, I'm amazed by this. Um, I, I, love, I love surveying. And um, I've, now I've got my own little um, archaeological project, those rocks on my friend's land. Uh, and it seems to me the first thing to start to do, we'll get in, maybe we'll talk about that, but the measuring of what directions things point and how far apart they are, love it. Okay, so, <laughs> and, um, but since I've got you, can we talk about 2012? Absolutely. So this, this always struck me as being kind of freaky and I, I never really trusted all the predictions these panels were making. There were just endless panels and books coming out, and then the movie came out. And uh, I, I have been, you know, acclimated to the the Mayan day count for many years. And my first astrology teacher was a pretty good day keeper. And this all seemed like, what what are these people on about? How are they surmising all all of this? And to me, the Mayan the day count. Uh, and the Tolkien seem sublime, beautiful, not like this is going to be a tidal wave <laughs> on, the, on, on day 144,000 of 13. No, it, it seems so sublime, I guess is the only word I can, I can think of. What was your whole take on like, and you live through it in slow motion, 2012. What did you think of the, these all these gringos on panels? <laughs> well, you know, on in the most positive regard, I was happy to see the entire world all of a sudden recognizing that the Maya exist. <laughs> I think as a as a uh, enlightenment, it was great that people were all of a sudden paying attention to a culture that's been, you know, basically. Uh, under attack for 500 years yes genocided so I, I even in the 50s about that yep um you know as far as the the spin about the maya calendar predicting the end i mean from the very beginning i thought well that's not even how maya see time i mean that's just they would never do that they see things as you know as as cyclical, they, uh, there's lots of Maya wisdom that talks about what has happened in the past will happen again. And it's not like a, like a record on repeat. It's more like a, I envision it kind of like a spring where it does go in the same cycles, but they're not exactly the same thing that happens. Each turn is slightly different, but in the same uh, you know, shape, I guess. So, you know, there, there was also the fact that, as you say, there, there are these cycles of Maya time, the Solkin and the Hob, which are the way they see things. The long count was made well after those two calendars, and it is more of a linear view of time. So it can go far into the future and far into the past. And really, I mean, mathematically, it's not a cycle. It's a continuous thing that has some cycles within it, a lot like our, the way we count our years, you know, it's 2021 this year, and that's 2021 years since a zero point that we, you know, arbitrarily picked sometime in the past. But it's, you know, it's got cycles within it, but overall it's a linear count of days. That linear count of days is what people latched onto. And really the Maya stopped paying attention to that at contact. I mean, the modern Maya people don't pay attention to the long count and 2012 meant nothing to them. It's the Solkeen and the Hob that really mean something to them and tell them about how to live and who they are. Contemporary Maya don't pay attention to the long count. <laughs> no. And they like the, they like the Solkeen, which is much more 
The hob is the civil calendar. Yes. Right. It's the solar calendar. Yeah. With 365 days. 365 days, but no leap years. So they've got a little thing going right. on. It, it drifted. And, you know, there's a lot of things we don't understand about why they made these calendars. The long count is really weird that its year is 360 days. So it's losing five days of the solar count every year. It's completely worthless to a farmer. They can't use that to farm at all. What amazed me about, and I don't know if this is some contrivance, but what amazed me about 12-21-12 is that it, it lands on the winter solstice and it lands in the year of transit of Venus. Yes. <laughs> well, given five, losing five days a year and all that stuff notwithstanding, that's pretty damn good. It is fascinating. I mean, there's there are ways to pick apart the long count calendar where you can see the foundations of it are very planetary um there's the their venus and its relationship with the earth seem to be at the core of the math and i don't want to make you know people's eyes spin back in their head trying to explain it all but there's an interesting correlation between earth and venus that the maya picked up on so did the babylonians but almost no other culture early on which is that there's a five to eight ratio between the two if you watch venus forever you notice that on average it comes back to the same place in the sky 584 days later it's really 583.92 if you do it but the maya had it at 584 and then the sun is, of course, 365, actually 365.2422, which the Maya actually had some way to calculate, it seems. But those two together, strangely, eight counts of the sun is exactly five counts of Venus. So there's this five to eight ratio. And that seems to be a bit of the foundation of that long count calendar. So it doesn't surprise me that it hits certain things along the way, especially on the Bach tunes. The trick is not every Bach tune hits so neatly. It, it was neat that the 13th did. The question is, did they plan that 2,000 years earlier? Yeah, I've pondered this. And, you, you, you know, per, per, perhaps my uh, beginner's mind, but I would think, okay, the year of a transit of Venus, that's cool. The year, the, the day of a solstice, that... But to have it both, that, that's that's a pretty good coincidence. By the way, here's a mandala. Here's a mandala of uh, the orbit of Venus, the middle one there. That's what it looks like. Huh. I've never seen that. That's kind of cool. So I'll, I can refer you to this book. Um, and so we we this we have an astrology audience. So there's going to be some wonks who think this is interesting and um, <laughs> uh, and so on. Well, good. So. <laughs> The, the the concept that there was some profound transformation cataclysm the end of time and all, all this stuff this has western intellectual roots basically that start in a 1973 book i think you said um i may have that date a little off i think it actually was the early 60s that that particular it's it's uh basically a textbook called the maya and at the time the author was michael co and he wrote He's, he's kind of uh, got a wry sense of humor, and he decided to write that if, uh, if the Maya re calendar reset to zero at this distant past point with that, that the Maya clearly tell us about, it correlates to the year 3114 BC, specifically on August 13th, that if it reset then, that it would reset again, like the odometer of your car. And that went up the, the when it arrived to the completion of 13 Bach tunes or 400 year periods, it reset to day one again. So if you did the math, you'd come up with 2012, December 21st. And so Co, an archeologist was the first to put that in a book and flippantly said, well, I guess the world restarts again. And that really started people picking up that ball and running with it in all sorts of directions. Right. Like um, Jose Arguez, for example. Oh, yes. Very popular book. More popular than any archaeology book ever. 
<laughs> uh, yeah. Um, and then um, Terrence McKenna picks up on it and or, or they around the same time who knows if they were talking and um oh i think they were and then uh it's conspiracy theory and then um <laughs> and then there's there's all this uh, i think absolutely i i i watched it all thinking this is ridiculous i mean i'm i'm a scholarly person and i've been sifting through spiritual bullshit and spiritual truths since uh you know, I could hold a book and I'm thinking, come on, guys, come, come on, guys. Good. So I'm, I'm get, gathering that you were a bit skeptical and taking a kind of a counterpoint. You were kind of saying like the other, what you're saying now that like, what, what's the big whoop? <laughs> basically well you know i mean i see both sides of it there there is a uh you know i look at the calendar very scientifically and mathematically and look at how it functions and i've made you know computer programs that that run it and show me all these things i'm always looking for hidden uh you know planetary conjunctions and things within it that they might have might have been the reason they were using it and made this complex system and we do have a really nettling issue that the Maya have a creation story called the Popol Vuh. And in the Popol Vuh, it's very clear that we, uh, or the Maya, I should say, were people of the fifth creation and that there were four creations before us. And they all actually ended rather cataclysmically. And so there's reason to believe that if we're in the fifth creation that at some point it will end and probably cataclysmically so then you apply the maya calendar to this and the the maya hieroglyphics are also very clear that at the end of the fourth creation they tell us the date and they tell us that it's the end of the 12th boktun or the the number 12 boktun it's technically the 13th just like our centuries go but when it arrives to 13 bach tunes instead of just going to 13 bach tunes in one day it resets to 0001 so that's the opening and it tells us that when 13 400 year periods of the fourth creation ended that the fifth creation began so you see where you know mathematically one would say well if this is a if we use our car odometer theory, that it should reset again when it reaches 13 and we'll be in the sixth Bakhtun. Okay. And based on what the Maya said happened in the other cartoons, there was, or Bakhtuns or creation, sorry, there's reason to believe that there was something cataclysmic that was going to happen. Right. And, and on a very long cycle, the, the thing cataclysmic does not necessarily happen on that day. It, it may happen in succession of that day. It's not a one day event. There, and there are all kinds of uh, cataclysms going on right now that are uh, outside of our, uh, our topic area. Uh, but we could say transhumanism is one of them. Uh, we've certainly entered a transhumanist uh, period of history post in the years surrounding 2012. By that, I mean the 20, 30 years surrounding even longer the 60s surrounding 2012 um you know the the type of technology that we're living with is getting a certain result uh, so we may not have seen the assuming a sixth creation and a cataclysmic end of the of, of 13 well we it may not be christmas day of 2012 that's not what we're talking about Right, even well, and 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 the question of whether the Maya thought that it was going to reset anywhere near here is the one that I really bring up. That number one, the Maya don't tell us how long the other four creations were. Yes, they don't say at all. They don't say that they were all thirteen Bakhtuns. And if we go to their neighbors, the Aztec, who also believe in multiple creations, they actually specified how long each creation was and it was not the same every time 
Yep. One of them's 312 years. Two of them are 676 years, which is all ridiculously small compared to what the Maya were talking about. But the thought that the Aztecs were comfortable that each creation had its a different time length calls into question that just because the fourth creation was 13 Voktunes, that this fifth creation would be. Right. Again, an, an assumption. Uh, an assumption. Uh, and it's, yes. And the, well, also we are, we're dealing with, um, I guess what's not strictly science at a certain point, these creations, the source of that information is priestly in a way. It's, it's not necessarily, look, I mean, we have enough time knowing what happened last week, right? We don't, we, there's, there's debates over what happened on January 5th or 6th, right? And all kinds of stories get piled up on it, whatever day that, that, that was during the insurrection. All kinds of stories get piled onto these things. And we're, we don't have these people to interview to sort them out. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm inc impressed that people can be looking at things on the walls of paintings and in, in uh, codexes and actually get, getting something. Uh, but as you said so eloquently, and I was looking for language to describe that, archaeology is a method, not a science. It's a method. Yeah, yeah. Very, very unpopular opinion in my field. <laughs> well, I, I say I, I say the same thing. I right in my terms of service, I say astrology is not the truth. It's a form of personally applicable fiction. Yeah, it's based on a, a scientific device. This whole thing is based on the US Navy's um, ephemeris. That's that much is scientific. What it means is is uh, much more poetic, and the the world view, the, we're always imposing our worldview on what we dig up, essentially. Oh, and it that's takes, for sure. And I see you questioning that a lot. You know, I've now watched sixty of your lectures, like <laughs> most people know me through my presentations, and you're always at, you're always saying, "Well, but maybe maybe that's only true as far as it goes. Maybe that's not." That's not quite it. So uh, let's briefly talk about your calendar. You do a calendar. I'm, I want to blatantly recommend that we uh, we have a, li a live person here who can explain <laughs> explain what he's done. And he, you've devoted your life to this, and l l largely, uh, I mean, you've done many things, but you your PhD is in my my in studies, and uh, you have your own calendar. I do. Thanks for bringing it up. I, I actually inherited it from another guy, but it is, it's a way to keep the ancient Maya calendar alive. It's, you know, me and another 7,000 day keepers in Guatemala are doing so. But in the, in the United States, a lot of people, you know, are interested in it, but they don't know exactly how it works. So I make this, uh, this annual calendar that is, uh, you know, the Christian 12 month calendar, but in each one of the day blocks, it also tells you what day it is in the Maya calendar. In the Tolkien and, and the long count or the hob? The, the Tolkien, the hob and the long count. Because mm -hmm. those are the three that the Maya and the classic period were really looking at. Nowadays, they modern Maya almost always look at the hob. I mean, the Tolkien. And then they pay attention to the hob a little bit just because there are five days at the end of every year that are called the Yeb. And they're kind of dangerous, unpredictable days where it's better to just do nothing. Just at the end of the out. 260. At the end at of the, the 365. And they they link into the uh the Sulkine. Um the, the two in the idea of Mesoamerica are intertwined. Um, the Hob so, and the Tolkien. Yeah, let me, let's say, you know, my, my calendar explains this a little bit in the first prefaces. My, the calendar is really just to keep this, you know, this calendar alive and to let people see a, a different rhythm of time, which I think your audience is particularly interested in. But the very first calendar that was made in Mesoamerica, which we're not sure the Maya, the Maya or the Olmec made it, we're not sure still, archaeology's vote is out. But it was the 260-day sacred calendar. And as far as we can tell, it had nothing to do with astronomy or astrology. Mm -hmm. 260 days is the gestation period of a human life. It's nine months. So they made a cycle that was particular to us. Then at some point, hundreds of years later, they said, well, you know, we also want to look at the 
solar calendar for agricultural uh, purposes and maybe something else. But they already had this calendar set up, this 261. So in their thinking of how time was already recorded, they simply brought it out another 105 days. There's a lot of, uh, except for the Maya, every other culture in Mesoamerica that uses 360 or 260, I'm sorry, lots of numbers here. Um, they just bring it out another 105 days to equal 365 and whatever day that hits in the Sulkine calendar is what's called the year bearer. And that's, that's the year, like the Aztecs will tell us it is the day of the Sulkine and then in the year, this year bearer, which is also a, a one of four things of the, the Sulkine. If you take uh, 20 day names and you run them out for 105 more days, that five, you know, 20 of them go into 100 evenly, and then there's a five remainder. And when that five remainder runs, it hits one of four of the 20 days repeatedly. So it's uh, for the Aztec, it's, it's house, rabbit, reed, flint. And so it'll go one house, two rabbit, three reed, four flint, one five house, and so on through 52 years. That's where they play this multiple, the lowest common multiple, highest common divisor kind of game that they love to play numerologically. 260 days and 365 days link up and match at 52 years or solar periods. So they go 52 years. That's, that's how the two calendars are linked together. Very interesting. So every other culture other than the Maya just did that. They didn't make the Maya made a hob calendar with months. Got it. So um, m mostly. So um, <laughs> I was going to go somewhere with this. The but the I think the calendar that that most people are interested in is the Tolkien, which is uh, there's a tw twenty day phase and a and a thirteen day phase. No, there's a thirteen. 13 symbols and 20 symbols. 13 numbers and 20 day names. So those two, they, there's no weeks, there's no months. When you combine 13 times 20, you get 260. So you have 260 unique day names. Combinations. Combination in, in of a the, number and a name. Right. Okay. And the so coefficient in the glyph. <laughs> yeah. So let's say, um, so this is the one that I think most people are interested in. It's the, it, it's, um, it, it is interesting, uh, you know, it's- Certainly it's in the Maya are most interested in it. If the Maya use it as a way to understand who they are and what to do on any given day. Yes, because it defines the, well, it describes the quality of the, of the day. Uh, one question I have is, let's say I'm born, you know, a certain day, how- a number, I forget what mine is, incredibly, and you don't know your rising sign, we'll solve that soon enough. Um, <laughs> we'll have an exchange. <laughs> we will. Um, how often does my birthday come up? My particular, let's say I'm nine eek or eight eek, e e e e ix? Every 260 days. That's why if your mom ah, got I see. pregnant on nine eek, she'd expect you to come out on nine eek. <sighs> ah, Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. So this is what we, so most of our contact with the concept of the Mayans is, it seems to be this calendar, the long count, which was not a high priority for them. And then these pyramids that are, that are, that are down there. So uh, we're going to do first 20 people who make any monthly donation to Planet Waves FM, get one of Ed's calendars, just get that ball rolling. So I'll I'll place that order a little later today, and we'll 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 mail them out. So any monthly, a dollar a month, a thousand dollars a month, whatever, we'll send you one. And they're beautiful. The photos you took these photos, right? Actually, it's a photo contest. I used to do all the photos myself, but then I thought it would be a fun way to involve my community. So I do a photo contest every year, and and uh, no, they're they're all from amateur photographers that have went down there. So you're the photo editor. I am. And you can verify that it's not like Zakara or something like that. 
Nope, nope. I I, I bet each one of them. <laughs> right. <laughs> you line it up with the Wikipedia. <laughs> so um, so there you go. That's that's that. And then uh, I'm gonna pitch your calendar because I've been aching for some connection to the Mayan day count for a long time. The people I originally was working with uh, when 2012 ended, they all disappeared. So, uh, and, and I'm, I'm glad I was not one of those people making all kinds of predictions for 12, 21, 12, because they were pretty much either wrong or off in the, in the spirit of what uh, they, they were. It was just not, it was a mess. So I'm glad that's all over. And now we can reflect and look back on it a little bit. And, um, and, and you know, I also have my Maya calendar app which that one's fun because it can anybody can use it to calculate their Maya birthday and it will tell you when you were born, what your personality and destiny are. You can also give it to friends. It's an easy way to calculate it. It's called Maya, not Mayan, but Maya calendar. And uh, it's, it's made by me, Ed Barnhart. It's only on iPhone now, but if enough people buy it, I'll make an Android version. Too. So I can link to that and people can download that and it's a couple of bucks. How much is it? Uh, 99 cents, I think. For the app? For the app. Really? Yep. That's a bargain. And it's it's fun. I, I I took a lot of time to look at only Maya sources to create that information. So it's not about dream spell or anything else like yes. that. It's it is purely what the Maya think. I've had the interesting pleasure in my life to meet a number of daykeepers and have very honest and cool conversations with them about it. So it's I I am certain it is what modern Maya people believe. This is what I love about your work. And I, I'm, I'm, a, yeah, th th you just, there you go. So hence I'm, I'm recommending this and, um, and, and let's have some fun. And now I will get my chance to actually um, learn this. I want to find a good workbook uh, for it. Maybe if there isn't one, we can make one. Awesome. So um, that's that. Uh, South America. Okay. Uh, I, <laughs> I heard you say, so I, I I watched 50 of your lectures and then you said, Oh, by the way, I have a hundred. So then <laughs> <laughs> the, in, in great court worth getting great courses. This is one of the greatest things ever put into video, by the way. Um, I'm, I love, uh, I, I got a professor for everything in my life. And um, I, I've watched a hundred physics lectures, uh, the bubonic plague series. That's worth watching. Then I discovered your stuff at some point over the summer. And then you, you said, well, I have a hundred, and I then I then South America came up on the log algorithm, and you began that by saying, "Well, I I was really, you know, reading books about South America during lunch in the fourth grade," and um, you one of your awesome wisecracks. Wow, there's a South America, so um, that was your thing, and they really didn't have it's it's kind of like the way Africa was when we were kids. It said un unexplored on the map, like in mad magazine remember that and they pull yes. down the map and it just says unexplored <laughs> uh, or better the ussr you know it's like 60 countries but they just put ussr and the whole thing is colored red well that's kind of like south america the, there have not it has not been explored like central america or egypt or anything uh like that and i gathering that's your passion and this is fucking fascinating this series is fascinating uh, I watched the Mummy one last night um, with the oh, people the in mummies, mummies being brought out and to oh. be at the party. They keep them in the <laughs> living room. They don't let they don't bury their ancestors. They just keep them around. I mean, <laughs> so can you tell us a bit about this? And um, you, I, I am gobsmacked. I mean, it's all I can do to not hitchhike to South America tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, but can you introduce us to the to the topic a little bit? Absolutely. You know, uh, you're right that, you know, th there has been a lot of archaeology done there and we, we don't want to, you know, dishonor the, the hard work that Peruvian archaeologists and other folks have done. But it's a pretty, uh, you know, inhospitable place to be doing archaeology between, you know, a lot of what we haven't found is in the high Andes and in the Amazon jungle. And both of those are really, really difficult to get around in. Yes. So, it, yep. it, it's it's a perfect place to hide entire civilizations. Even Guatemala, there's entire. Oh yeah, the Patan is, is, is the barely cities. explored. It's it's yeah. crazy. There's still and that's a little easier cities out there. But you know, I, in terms of South America, if people do 
know something about ancient South America, it's almost always the Inca. And the Inca were a fantastic uh, society. I mean, at their peak, they were well over 10 million people and not one person went hungry in their entire empire. It was an amazing achievement of civilization. But it was also the culmination of 5,000 years of cultures that led up to what the Inca were able to do. And that's what people don't really realize about South America, how deep its history is. Yes. Yeah, it seems to go, it seems like everything that happened happened in South America, even though they obviously were not getting FedEx packages from Cairo with blueprints for pyramids, they may have been first, at, at least among the people we know about, to have uh, have pyramids uh they they do seem to be and certainly by a large stretch mummies the mm. chinchero mummies are thousands of years older than anything in egypt or china and it's also as you were saying you know they're so isolated from certainly anything in what you know i refer to as the old world you know china and uh and europe and africa but uh it's so old when they're so isolated like that. When when somebody figured out how to build a house, that was an invention. Yes. In South America, it was not an adaptation from another culture who showed them. When they learned to weave, that was a, that was an invention. When they learned how to make their amazing kipu, that was an invention. They they were isolated enough where everything that they came up with was independently discovered, which really gives me uh you know it it gets my mind turning about you know theories of human parallel development mm -hmm. you know there's we we oftentimes misalign that you know uh star trek used it to you know suggest that you know america and capitalism is the best thing in the universe but uh but there is really i think something to be said about a concept of human parallel development that even in isolation our ideas build upon each other in, you know, fairly uh, uniform ways, which is fascinating to look at a culture like that and know what they did in isolation from these other ones that we Westerners counted as our ancestors. It's mm -hmm. a, it's a lesson about how we're all really the same. I mean, Jung's collective unconscious keeps coming to mind as I'm watching the South America series in particular. Uh, that that symbols arise, and Jung Jung uh, had the, the case of the um, the psych patient who came who who had the vision of the of the waving penis that makes the wind, and and this patient Jung was certain had no possible way to have read the text in ancient Iranian or Persian uh, mythology that had exactly that symbol. And that was one of the things that led to his discovery of the collective unconscious, that there is a level, there's another plane of reality. And all these, be all these folks that you, that you like to go hang out with and measure their shit, they're all on this wavelength they're, that there's some other, there's other planes of reality. We exist on one of those, if you, they're vertical or whatever you want to think of them. I think of them as being almost like, um, on alignment that's like pivots by like one degree and suddenly we're in another reality or there's a whole gaming dimension of the internet going on in parallel to our conversation and there's a whole lot of people who all they do on the internet is game and, you know, and, and people I, like us don't think about that but it's right next to us it's right in the world next to us and it's invisible which is which which gets me i mean right now in this modern world I mean, if you could turn on right now a light that would show you all the cell phone signals and cable signals and radio signals that are passing in front and around us, it would it would be a a, a ball of yarn. And yeah, so I mean, I'm we, in the country. If, if all that happens invisibly and we made it, is yeah, is nature also making such things? Yeah, because we're well, part of nature. If we can yeah. do it, they can do it. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, and I, I think that all of our internet and digital communication technology is only a metaphor for what really ex existed long, long ago and, and still exists in, 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 in truth. Um, and so there, the, this concept of a pyramid 
uh, was around for a long time before uh, the Giza Plateau, before they started building them on the Giza Well, I, I do, you know, I, I'll, I'll be a, a wet rag scientist, logical person and give you my, my, my boring reason for pyramids all over the world, if, it, if you'd allow yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, give me the, the most dull, uninteresting it's really, reason. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not cool, but it's, it's the truth. Uh, or it's not the truth. It's my idea. It, it's my conception of it. Um, you know, if you're a kid with a bunch of blocks and you want to, to create something tall, you make a couple of towers and they fall over. And then you figure out without gluing make these together, base. make a fat base and go to a skinny top and that will stand up. And that, I think they just wanted to make really tall stuff all over the world. And they figured out that a pyramid is pretty stable like that. <laughs> yep. Yes. Boring, I mean, I boring, saw a Saqqara. But logical. <laughs> made of, no, 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 it's true. But, you know, I mean, the one at Saqqara, I've been to Egypt. I have not been south. I'm pulled north and you're pulled south. Uh, at Saqqara, this thing is made out of bales of hay and mud. And it's still standing there. Bales of hay and I, mud. I've been and there. it's like 4,000 years old. Did you, off topic, did you, did you experience the sound healing uh, chambers in that place where there's a booth like a dark room and you walk through the booth, it's like a stone thing and you go in just like in a dark room and there's a block, the stone wall and there's a opening in the stone wall, which is a, a space about maybe two feet wide and about two feet deep and you stick your head in. No, I didn't see that. I walked through some long are, chamber with like what were like closets on either side. Those were the closets. And into the pyramid. The, okay, it was in one of those closets. So in those closets. So we, we were lucky we had a good corrupt tour guide who could bribe everyone to get us into everything we needed to get into. And you, so I got to do this and stuck my head in that thing. And I heard a sound. I have never heard before and cannot replicate. It was two or three tones at once. There was nothing to make a sound. And they were, and the reason for the dark room thing was so it could be silent in there. And they were said to be sound healing temples. And it was the, the sensation was sticking my head out a window in the universe. Huh. And the well, sound happens. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't Saqqara created by Emotep? Who was also a uh, a medical practitioner? I could be. I don't know that, out but of it would make there, sense if I think all those a, closets. He was kind of a Renaissance man who understood architecture, but also he was grounded in medical science. So, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised mm -hmm. if Emotep's place had a <laughs> had mm -hmm. a sound healing concept. I mean, he was. Uh, uh, I think he was one of the most dynamic people in world history. Interesting. Okay, so let's go back to South America. We briefly visited uh, Egypt for a second. Maybe we'll come back to that someday. Um, you, um, you mentioned the uh, the Fang God, the Fang deity. Yes, I'm the Fang deity with who is um, who who moves who's far and wide down, down there. Um, I, the 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 feeling I keep getting is, and I know this is unprovable by science and it may not be provable by method this seems to be a real entity this is not uh this is not just a comic book uh this is not batman um oh no this I seems mean, especially to be to the people that worshipped him for thousands of years i think he was quite real i mean you know if if, if we're going to question the existence of the fang deity we should also simultaneously question the existence of god that's uh, cause, cause yeah, that's, and the that's, that's difficult to describe. <laughs> it's difficult to describe. And there's a lot of uh, clouding put, putting on that. But the, this this creature is given a face and he appears many, many places. Now, obviously, they had time to bring their artwork around and all, all of this stuff. Uh, but they're also using a lot of psychotropic drugs or not, maybe not psych entheogenic drugs to access the astral and meet entities. Mescalito comes to mind. Uh, from the, I understand, apocryphal works of, uh, of, of uh, Castaneda, but th I, I, there I are, you act, <laughs> oh, good, okay, <laughs> yeah, well, there's a discussion, there's, there's, you know, he, there's a discussion. He became, you know, a fantastic showman, but I mean, the core of what he was talking about is, is very, very real to millions and millions of people. 
yeah what you know whether it's based on a, an actual a person or compositive teachers and so forth i find it's valuable information but anyway the, they're they're using entheogenics to access an astral plane and you meet spirits there you will meet entities on on the astral when you go hang out there um, and some of them are not very friendly, and um, and some of them are are friendlier, and they they have a life of their own. Yes, absolutely. I mean this this concept of the other world. I mean, you know, yeah. uh, other, right. Christianity has its thumb on uh, on the world, and it's varying. <laughs> yes. uh, you know, I it, it always amuses me how similar Christianity, Islam, and Judaism really are. I mean, they all share. The same book at the start uh yep. but those collectively you know they drive the idea about you know the the world beyond but all of north america all of the americas believed in this other world where there were spirits to be contacted when you go to sleep you go to that world when you take right. drugs you uh you go to that world and it's a you know it's a near-death state i think that they were you know we kind of see them as taking you know, taking drugs is what we'll say today, but they, I think they were very well cognizant that they were putting themselves in a near death state. And that's how they were able to travel to that other plane and meet these spirits. Yes. And those spirits get, you know, mixed up through the Western eyes to talk about a pantheon of gods. But really, I think there was one deity in South America the Fang deity, or I Iapek, or Viracocha, whatever you want to call him, but the fascinating thing is that he's a jaguar. That he so he came from the Amazon. All these big cultures we know of are all up in the Andes and down on the coast, but that guy crawled out of the Amazon. There's a lot to be found there that we don't understand yet, including the foundations of their religion. Right. So that's in a sense maybe their holy land or the kind of a source. Like we, you know, we have these desert religions that, uh, you know, come come out of uh, Galilee and uh, the Dead Sea and all that stuff. Uh, By the way, I'm uh, starting to feel if, just for your listeners, if they're interested in this topic of the Fang deity, I I do a free podcast called Archeo Ed. And my last two episodes were about the Fang deity. The first one's just the Fang deity, and then it's specifically what the Moche culture thought of him. So there's a there's an hour worth of me talking specifically about that topic for free out there on the on the interwebs. Good, happy to link to that when, when we we pull together uh, your your page here. Um, so what are the properties of this Fanged deity? Well, I uh, you know. Properties in terms of, uh, you know, iconography and art history, he has very, you know, when they're portraying him, he's got very specific qualities. He's got goggle eyes. He's got fanged teeth. That's where the fang deity thing comes up. He's also got claws. He's a humanoid. He's standing there. He's kind of gargoyle-ish, isn't he? I mean, he is a bit gargoyle-ish, at least in visage, but he has, you know, he also has snakes coming off of his head. And he has snakes coming off of his belt and uh, and claws on his hands and on his feet. And each culture shows him with a little more or less detail, more abstract, less abstract. But he is also clearly connected to the practice of chopping people's heads off. Right. So there, there is a there is a some people call him the decapitator deity. Um, and separate Yuck. him from other things. But that, I think, again, comes from the Amazon. We know today people are chopping people's heads off, and we know why they're doing it. It's about trapping their spirit in that head so it can then be used in that altered state, in that other world, as kind of a supernatural posse for the person who owns the head. I, I, I watched that one. I think it was the Mummy The mummy episode had the shrunken heads. The I was so now I'm a little unclear when you're chopping off when when whoever is chopping off the head of whomever, what exactly are they trapping in the head? Some third thing or the spirit of the person whose head they chop off? The spirit of the person their head whose head they chopped off. If they just let it go, if they just kill them and walk away from the body, it becomes what 
a lot of Amazonian tribes call a Mwisak, which is this dangerous spirit that's just kind of a wild animal loose. It transforms. It's that still that person. And that person's coming for you. <laughs> now they're a spirit and they're going to come for you because you killed them. But if you trap them, then they have to do your bidding. Uh, so that's the little, whole little conquering. Gruesome, really, but that's the... That's how clearly the uh, Amazonians today describe the process and why they do it. And then you go back to art on the Peruvian coast a thousand years earlier, and all of those pieces are depicted right there. They didn't have a written language, but that meant they were communicating messages through their art. And luckily the moche especially left us some, you know, to date I think we have a, around a, 200,000 pots that tell all sorts of stories painted on and all these weaving all this weaving also yeah. um, like like this one right here here's here's one this is this is, is that's that, a, the is that an actual artifact is that an actual artifact no no i bought this for nine bucks from a cool guy named uh and hell in trujillo peru so it, right so it's it's a reproduction right of a spur pot Right, I never, yeah, I never take have... artifacts. Those are natural, national or world patrimony. But I, I do love replicas. <laughs> I, I got that right off of your vibe <laughs> immediately, and I, I was, um, I, I appreciated your, um, your commentary that the um, one of the reasons why these uh, very, very old cultures in South America were not so popular uh, is because there's not gold and silver in the in in the things. And you seem to explain archaeology as being like a um, alternative to looting, <laughs> basically, because <laughs> you got to either have looters crack it open or archaeologists who hopefully are going to turn the antiquities over to the prevailing, you know, tribe or national government. There, they are not that different, especially in in methodology. They're using the same thing. In fact, most of the looters are trained by archaeologists and. And most of the archaeologists are trained by looters. If we look at it from a historical perspective, you know, the, the early archaeologists were all just rich dilettantes who decided, you know, what I ought to do is go dig up another culture and sell it to a museum so I can keep doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, when, you, when I saw the Elgin Marbles in the Museum of London, it really occurred to me. Those things no, belong the, back the, in Greece. Those Athens, things should be sent Athens right back to Greece. Built, Athens built a magnificent museum specifically to hold those marbles and and it's time for it's the british museum to cough them up of course if they do they have to give up everybody else's treasures too so they're in a That's bit of a bad bind there <laughs> right so um the in 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 the south american cultures there's all of this pre uh pre-ceramic pottery uh Mummies, it's not the it's not the Tutankhamen, Tutankhamen thing with good gold masks this big and things like this, but rather it's bona fide historical record. And it seems to go back to when the glaciers were treating in the northern hemisphere. You're talking 13,000, 15,000 years ago, right? Well, we don't, I don't think we have any mummies that early, but we have uh, the site of, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, not Mesa Verde, uh, Monte Verde, which is uh, 14,800 years ago. That's on the coast of South America in, uh, in Peru. Actually, might be a little south of Peru. But anyway, that's very, very old, and there were definitely people there, and that was in a bog, so we got all sorts of uh, organic materials mm -hmm. and learned that they were using over 200 plants from the region, so they weren't newcomers. They knew exactly what they were doing. They had lived there for a while. But of course, that just got blown out of the water but what, by what was just found in New Mexico, in uh, White Sands National Park. They've been able to successfully now date these footprints that we knew forever by finding them in, in compact layers in between things that we could date. And those are coming up at 23,000 years ago. Yeah. So now we have really absolute human proof at 23,000 years ago in New Mexico. So that, yeah. that's a big game changer. Yeah, I mean, 
I have long, long, long pondered this and this the idea of being in the sixth creation or something. There has been, I think, civilization after civilization after civilization rising and falling and hardly leaving a trace. Except somebody kind of finds an unfired clay pot left <laughs> left around from the year 12,000 BC, but that's not that easy to find. Uh, I think that what we're living through is just the latest iteration of things that have just happened over and, and over and over again. And there's no telling, you know, except your kind of holographic study of like, well, we know what happened there. We got some clue. We know they were there. And you're right. Before, you know, that archaeology is a very blunt tool. When people build things out of perishable materials, they perish and yep. we don't see them at all. Yeah, and ultimately it's all perishable. The you know the pyramids will not be there someday. Maybe it may take twenty thousand more years, but you know they're slowly going away. They're slowly turning to dust. I mean that's just how it is here. That that is the passage of time. Even though the the pyramids, I mean you know that's the, I, I think you could have said almost any other thing, and I would have been more heartily in agreement. But those dang things, I mean you know I love the phrase. Uh, uh, man fears time but time fears the pyramids that's that that that's they they've been around forever yeah, i mean the mud, they're, the they're mud and hay amazing. one made me really happy at sakara right it's like some good formulation of mud and hay to to, to, to last that it, and it doesn't look like better homes and gardens but you can still tell what it is and you can still go inside well you know it is helpful that it's in the middle of a desert if that same thing was built in in guatemala it would it would be a puddle now. <laughs> yeah. And there weren't glaciers there, right? I mean, or were there? No, not in, uh, not as far as Egypt. So, or, or Guatemala for that matter. The glacial didn't reach down that far. No, no. The glaciers ended in, in Long Island here in North America. The terminal moraine is, that's what Long Island is, is a terminal moraine. That's, so that that's was not as far as it crept down. Yeah, and I, I keep wanting to hang out like right south of the glacier while it's just dumping all of its stuff right on Long Island and see what it's like to look at a mile high pile of ice uh, dropping boulders on the land and pebbles, pebbles too. The, um, the coast of Peru is amazing like that. There's all these cuts where it's just you know, hundreds and hundreds of feet of nothing but cobbles this big and you can do, it, it was just the ice just crushing everything on its way into the ocean so were there glacial periods of tra traceable from the southern hemisphere from the southern ice cap yes so there's there were previous sort of thing, they were reaching both directions ah okay so ah okay i hadn't considered the southern version of the ice age in in the lower southern hemisphere so you're it's, saying there's evidence of ice ages there too yep it just happened in our summer <laughs> no i that's that that's a joke but it's an you know, australia the, joke the, yes. these uh <laughs> the, it is really weird to think that we're, we're just not used to thinking about south america living here in the northern hemisphere like simple things like their kids school break right in the middle of it is christmas that's their summer break that's so weird it's yeah i mean i have enough friends from australia <laughs> that the <laughs> seasonal part is a little more uh Nat natural uh what to do with the astrological science is another question do you reverse all of the G gaelic holidays you put beltane in november and Samhain in may for example huh. so that 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 debate sparks up from uh from from time to time because our, our our astrology is based on a whole northern mythology so it's local it's local to kind of greece england ireland nordic and that kind of all that european I, i've stuff. had to train myself to say june and december solstice instead of winter and summer because though that's not the same thing in in south america yeah yeah and as an astrologer i can say cancer solstice capricorn solstice which is true it's the sun square tropic of capricorn is the capricorn solstice sun square tropic of cancer is the cancer solstice ah that's um, nice Right. I mean, that's that's why right. that's where the names come from. Right. I mean, it's uh, it's it's tro tro it's a tropical zodiac it's, and it's based on the sun's alignment to the tropics, including the equator. 
right? Uh, at 23 and a half degrees north and 23 and a half degrees south. That's a, you know, that that's something I pay attention to because I think the Maya did and the Khmer culture did, the two really big civilizations that are in the tropics. It's funny that, you know, people, people think of uh, Egypt as tropics, but it's not. I mean, all of, all, except the very Southern bit of, of uh, the Egyptian empire was north of 23 and a half. So was most of what, uh, oh, well, all of the Roman world, all of the Greek world, about half of India, so they, right. they were outside the tropics, which means they didn't have a zenith passage sun, which is something I'm always looking for evidence that they understood, because that's a that's a fun one when you're, you know, you, as an astrology person, you know, where the sun is is very important. And all around the world, everybody has solstice, everybody has equinox on the same day. But zenith passage changes on your latitude. Now, Chichen Itza's day when the sun is directly over their head at noon is different than the day that Palenque has. And the sure. Maya were talking about it. They were talking about, hey, when's your zenith? When's my zenith? And let's communicate back and forth about it, which is fascinating when you're looking at this, at, when you're looking at how everything moves and all of a sudden you realize, oh my God, is the sun different where you are? That's that's a trip, and that's something that they focused on, and so did the Khmer. It it's different in many <clears throat> in many different ways. I mean, uh, I, I was once sitting in a um, a plaza in the Hague, and uh, in that whole part of the world, the sun is different. There's a some filter over Netherlands and Belgium that lent itself to to certain forms of lighting. That I've never seen this kind of light anywhere. I'm a photographer also, so I, I'm looking at the light everywhere. And I was sitting in a plaza. It was a very strange. It was a round plaza in The Hague, very very old plaza. I was with a friend. We had just gotten some fantastic pot from one of the lovely places you can get that. We smoked a little, and we're sitting there in this utterly silent plaza. And it's evening, and the light is striking the buildings in a certain way. And I said, "Was." okay now i'm drawing a blank on the name of the painter the most famous dutch painter was he dutch rembrandt i said rembrandt. was rembrandt dutch uh-huh because the light looked exactly like rembrandt was was painting it and i wish i still had my apartment in belgium uh for the light coming in the, in the window so the light the sun is different it is different ba based on a million different factors it's a natural phenomenon so they had local solstices called zenith celebrate like zeniths there and then 500 miles away there zenith zenith passage happens only in the tropics and it changes from day to day uh it's like it will move about 20 miles every day it'll go you know you'll hit you'll hit your uh equinox yeah you know, so you have equinox here and you have a solstice here the north the june solstice the summer solstice and the sun moves on the horizon every day, and it finally hits June solstice. And it seems to stop that for day, a couple of that days. That day at 23 and a half degrees, that day is the day that the sun is directly over your head. So at exactly that line, the sun will go directly over your head at 23 and a half degrees north. But then as you go south, every day for each latitude is, is a time each one of them will have their own day of zenith passage. So like Palenque's is uh, coming, coming back down from, the, from solstice towards equinox. Palenque's is August 7th, but Chichen Itza's is June, or no, July uh, 17th, I think. So they're different. And they would talk about it to each other. We know that they were emulating each other's uh, zenith passages. There's an idea that the calendar was created at exactly 15.8 degrees latitude because that day, that at that latitude, zenith passage perfectly breaks up the calendar into 260 days and 105 days. 
from one zenith to the next zenith is 105 days, leaving you 260 days. So it's like a perfect place where the sun splits out the sacred calendar from the solar calendar. The, 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 the two zeniths being the suns on the way <clears throat> south after the northern solstice and on the way north after the southern solstice. And those two zeniths are separated by 105 days. Yes, I'd say the equinox to the north solstice and then the north solstice back to equinox. They go back and forth there because right at zero degrees, the day of zenith passage is equinox and it'll only happen one day. <clears throat> two, they're at zero, zenith passage only happens one day a year. At, uh, at well, I guess maybe twice. But at 23 and a half degrees, that's at sol at solstice at that angle. It's at that zenith passage, right? Yeah. So the, the all the people doing this were more tuned into the natural world than our society is. Absolutely. I mean, you they you, were involved. You're, you're probably were, an exception, but yes, our society. I, I mean, I do my best. And sure, you know, I, I <laughs> like. Uh, I, I I could I could slip into your uh, your life work easily if I just it's it's amazing I mean you're and you're on in the physical sense I've explored it somewhat physically mostly conceptually uh, and I I'm about to go excavating some rocks on my friend's backyard <laughs> since I can get there and I can get a little shovel and a brush we should uh, we should talk about that I'll give you a little bit yes. of hints how to do it in a in a way that you can record it. Yes. Yeah. Th thank you. I appreciate that. I, I cannot want a better, uh, better, better instructor there. Uh, one question I've had for you is um, in all of your uh, exploration around these areas and, and looking into things and talking to people, have you ever seen, have you ever paused and said, there's something off world going on? Not like a, not a parallel dimension, like Mr. Fang deity, but like any evidence like, for example, were there really F-15 like airplanes found in South America in, 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 uh, as artifacts? That's complete hokum. I mean, you know, it's, it, it's, it's art history. It's, it's interpretation of what you see. I think I know what you're talking about. They're the Muisak gold pieces that were found uh, outside of Bogota. Um, and some of them do look like little airplanes, but they're bugs. <laughs> they're not airplanes. They they're, they're not bugs, but but I've 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 seen uh, I haven't read but seen that they uh, tested them aerodynamically and they got a good result that there was they understood aerodynamics but well I mean I I don't know about that study at all but I I think uh, bugs are also aerodynamic some of them are pretty <laughs> damn good at flying <laughs> the, I've seen those pieces you're talking about and they are like uh, dragonflies or butterflies they're they're, they're 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 gold uh images of of bugs that's not what i'm talking about so let me see if i can dig that out sometime and and um and they were, these were more shaped like f-15 aircraft than uh than than like bugs well, i'd um, be happy to take a look but so have you but have you ever paused and said hmm maybe there's some crossover here you know have, have not... you ever seen a single thing that has given you a hint that maybe there's another we've been visited I am open to the possibility, but no, not in my experience have I ever thought that. And I, I guess, you know, I'm somewhat cautious in that because there is a, you know, there is a compunction for, of some to misuse that. Yes. To um, turn to the explain, next 2012. <laughs> explain how weird little brown people could do these things. That you know somehow it had to be aliens, it had to be Atlantis. You know how could these these impoverished uh, savages do this sort of thing? That that you know that gets used as a cudgel against some of these cultures. So I I have a pushback in general that I I suspect the agenda of certain people. You know not in a you know not in an evil snidely whiplash way, but in in the kind of casual racism that everybody doesn't know they're doing. Um, there, there's all too often an urge to explain the achievements of, uh, of, you know, basically brown cultures. 
Uh, How do you think uh, they move ro- stones that big that we can't even move today, though? That that's what amazes me, that some of these stones or even our own best construction equipment couldn't even move them. You know, it, it it's not undoable. I mean, it, I think that our construction equipment can move big things now, but but even people people can do it. I mean, there's you know some of it is still mystery, which I love. But, uh, you know, there, there are, we have shown ways that people can use log rollers or here's one, here's one you'd love to see. Uh, look up a guy named Wally Wallington. Um, I forget, he's all over YouTube, Wally Wallington. He's a, he's a construction, a retired construction guy who's built Stonehenge in his backyard in Wisconsin by himself. And it's amazing. And he just uses these really simple concepts. His core concept is, is two little balls under a big stone can swivel it and move it back and forth. And he does it all. Uh, it's called like Forgotten Technologies or something, but he's got a whole bunch of videos of him step-by-step step building Stonehenge himself, just him. Actual size or a replica? Actual shrunken? size. His wife is like pissed off that he spent their entire retirement like, on cement. But there's there, there mm-hmm. is uh, uh, he builds these huge things out of cement, and then he moves them big distances, and then he hoists them up. He's a. Uh, it's so funny. He's just a regular old construction guy. I mean, he's not some kind of brilliant scientist. His when he finally builds it, his his son in laws are like. Hey, what are we gonna call it? Let's call it like uh, let's call it Wally Hinge. No, let's call it Stonehenge Reloaded. They're just a bunch of yahoos, but the but the guy has figured it out, and if he could do it, yeah, you know, okay, it's it's kind of amazing, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, and Stonehenge is impressive. Wally. You're welcome, Wally. I said when I saw that stuff, I was like, <laughs> I'm sending Wally my money. He needs more cement. <laughs> Excellent. Um. Another lingering question here while I'm uh, in the Ask Me Anything session. Um, trading seafood. Now, how do they keep it fresh? Now, you, you, you've said several times, the shells, I understand, right? You've got the Indians in Long Island trading sh- shells for the Indians in the upstate. But how do they get the fish? How do they keep the fish fresh for long enough to get it? They weren't, there was no cold chain, ice, ice packs, how- well, I mean, there's a couple of different things. One, what by the time we get to the Inca, they have that amazing runner system, and they could actually, with the chaskis, the runners that would run their guts out for about 20 kilometers to the next way station where another guy would be waiting and run. The Inca, they say at least, could actually up in the mountains in Cusco say, "I'd like an ocean fish for dinner," and begin the chain of runners. And by dinner time somebody had run back up the Andes with a fish. And now it involved, you know, a thousand guys running their guts out for 20 kilometers at a time, but he could get it there that fast. That's how efficient the Inca Chosky runner system was and across their Inca roads. But if we, if we dispense with fresh and just transporting and trading fish, the Inca are actually, uh, and probably before the Inca, are responsible for the invention of how to uh, create jerky. They would create fish jerky. And actually our term, our word jerky is a Quechua word. It's jerky. And we, we call it jerky, but they, they perfected a way to dry out fish and then transport it and keep it for much longer. My wife was like, shut up, Cliff Clavin. That's not true. And she looked it up and it was true. She, she hates it when I have weird little factoids like that, but it's true. They, they were able to, they, they developed a technique to dry it. They also did this weird thing with potatoes in the same way that they could keep forever. Ah, I had, turkey, hadn't, pres- preservation had not occurred to me. Yeah, they, 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 they are the inventors of, of jerky. Next time you're enjoying a piece of jerky, thank, thank the Inca. Well, and I was also in my email to you last night lamenting how few words, uh, native word, you know, indigenous words from the Americas have gotten into indigenous language. We could probably do an interesting article on on indigenous words that have made it into the dictionary. There are a, a good bit of them. You know, there's funny little words you wouldn't expect. Uh, one example, the, the Maya gave us the word shark. <laughs> uh, the Maya word is shock. 
X-O-K. The, the Spanish word is tiburon. That's not anywhere near there. When, no. when we call that creature a shark, we're actually saying a Maya word. Huh. <laughs> I wonder what Doug, uh, Doug has to say about that. Etymology of shark. Hurricane as well. The, the Maya have a, a deity named Hurukan, who's the deity of these high winds, and that's where we get the word hurricane. There, an old theory, the English word is from a Mayan word, XOC, Jacques, which meant shark. Northern Europeans seem to not have been familiar with the larger sort of sharks before voyages to the tropics began. A slightly earlier name for it in English was Tiburon. Huh. From Spanish Ooh. Tiburon, 1530s, 1520s. Am I, am I being live validated by Google? Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> by, by, uh, by um, my, my memory is not uh, fully performing today, but... Um, the editor of Etymology Online Dictionary is uh, fa fabulous. I, I've corresponded with him many times and had my own personal etymology lessons. And he basically devotes himself to an etymology dictionary 24 by 7 and wrote the entire oh. thing. It's really one of the best things on the entire internet. That is it's, so fun. It's etymology to, like, Online Dictionary. The and the history of them and there's you know there's it's kind of an archaeology really it's an archaeology of language of, of um dusting it off and uh and, and yeah. like tracking the uses like when the first time bachelor party was used like when bachelor goes back to like 1401 but like bachelor party is like 1876 uh, it's so fascinating the uh you know. the yeah the entomology of these words i love it and so i I, I'm glad so, that he shares my opinion about. So sharks. Doug, uh, Doug, Doug says uh, mine word uh, an old theory. He calls it an old theory, but he's not disparaging of it uh, at, at all. And uh, certainly, Jock, Jock sounds a lot more like shark than um, shock, 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 shock than That's tiburon. That's the the, uh, the in in Mesoamerican languages, an X is an sh sound, shock. and so uh, the. Ah. Uh, the Aztecs' uh, word for obsidian was X I T. I'll let you sound that out in your head. <laughs> Zit. Shit. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right up. Um, one last thought, and um, it it involves uh, doing you know local archaeology, right? Because not everyone can um, get to. Gu Guatemala, and I, I, I reckon because I'm I'm not taking uh, any COVID injections, it's going to be a while uh, before I can get down there. Uh, but I'm fortunate to live in an area where there's interesting stuff, and uh, I, I think that um, we can all learn a lot from not walking past things so quickly, uh, particularly in the country. But I mean, for example, in Paris, my favorite thing, my favorite place in all of Paris, was the archaeological crypt. Have you, have, uh, on uh, it's right at the end of the Notre Dame plaza. There's like face of Notre Dame, and then there's a big plaza about the size of a football field. And at the end of that, it looks like a metro station. But when you go down there, you find out that they've excavated underneath the plaza a Roman oh, uh, catacombs. Well, it's a, it's called the archaeological crypt of Paris, and it's a Roman neighborhood. It's not catacombs. It's storefronts, hypercost heating systems k's from the sen with the sen moved apparently and i used to love to go down there and it was Gosh, i walked right over that and didn't even know it <laughs> yeah and so it's uh I, I i went down there as many times as i could my press pass saved me through three euros every time i i went down there and and from studying about what these rock walls may be i'm thinking there's a whole universe of of local archaeology that people can do Oh, you know, there is, I mean, the, the ancient history in North America is everywhere and people don't realize it. What it, they, they do walk right past it every day. Almost every part of the country you be in, you know, save a couple of little places like, you know, the, the Great Plains, things like that. But in your neck of the woods, I mean, geez, there was, you know, literally thousands and thousands of years of culture before Europeans ever showed up. And, you know, I mean, Europeans count as culture too. H historic archeology span is still awesome and cool and worth preserving. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and people don't realize too that almost every county has its own historical society 
and an archaeology society and they invite people to come in and be volunteers for projects all the time you know archaeology doesn't make any money we don't make guns or butter so we're always dependent on interested volunteers yep. now one caution i would say though you know when it's your land it's your land you get to do what you want to do with it but archaeology is not a repeatable experiment so mm -hmm. you know whoever does it what they record and who they share it with that's what the rest of humanity gets so it's not a repeatable experiment if you're gonna do it you know at least google some archaeological forms and take some photos because that what you do there will be what the rest of humanity into the future knows about whatever it is yep. if you yep. find something important heck you should share it with the world Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I'm I'm very interested in pursuing um, Matt, I believe Matt Bua's uh, a long, a long investigation into these um, stone walls in New England, 252,000 miles of them, according to a USDA survey, only in New England, only in the northeastern states, 252,000 miles. I would love to know what you find out about it. You know, you you uh, reminded me of this, and I looked a little bit into it uh, in the last couple of days, and I'm fascinated to hear what you find out about it. It seems yep. like most people think it's somehow um, uh, European after initial contact. It may or may not be. I'm kind of fascinated how similar it looks to Irish stuff, that it's like the... Uh, Celtic and after Celtic, the kings of, of, of Ireland were still really very much uh, Gaelic at uh, first contact in the Americas. I, uh, my, my running theory at the moment is that it may well have been people who wanted to remain Gaelic and were pressured by England and came over in boats and then just went north where nobody would bother them and built the same sort of thing they were building in uh, Ireland. I've been in a lot of the Ireland sites and the, the dolmens are there, things that look reminiscently like passage tombs are there in New England. Mm -hmm. And those long stone walls, they were, they were building similar things all over uh, like County Mayo. If you look at some stuff from County Mayo, the, the constructions are strangely similar. That's, that's my bet. But kind that's of like the pyramids, of archaeology. You never the, know. The interesting part is, and we really, you know, we need to use the method here, but the amount of time it would take in to, to construct these said to be in 100 years, there were not very many people here in 1750. Well, and so they someone did the calculation of how long it would take and uh, to, to construct 252,000 miles of this, and it would be impossible based on a time calculation assuming full-time activity of every man woman and child nine months a year there still wouldn't have been enough time so that's what got my attention but he's saying that uh there there uh there may be um uh canal systems below them that they may conceal things and so they need to be excavated i think uh there's well, you know I, every human that builds things like that drops trash Stuff. and things from their life underneath it and it's in a sealed context that's what we archaeologists do you know when they when we want to figure out how old a building is we dig under it and look for the the wrappers and trash the guys <laughs> that built it dumped in there and that's what tells you yes you find the snickers wrapper from <laughs> from 5000 bc with the copyright on it that's right um <laughs> The um, and interestingly, the same piece of land was a major kind of hippie colony for many, many years, uh, because it was like a dude ranch uh, where the hippies hung out. And so I've always thought those are the trash pits to dig up. I want to see, you know, I want to find some Coke bottles and, and uh, <laughs> that, that, you know, pocket knives uh, from that, that era. For years, I had um, a comb that I, I found after one of the hurricanes. That's not it, but it was similar because the hurricane churned up the land. I found a subway token from uh, the 70s uh, th there because it just moved everything around, including very, very large rocks, like 10 ton rocks were moved by one of the hurricanes, by the cascade of water. I mean, I know that rock was, th that thing was there and it's not there anymore. And that's, it's somewhere else. It's moved, it shifted 20 feet or, <laughs> but there was a lot of, 
What's that? The power of nature is just so amazing when you see it move multi-ton stones like that. Yeah. And it's amazing there's anything left after all of these glaciers and retreats and hurricanes and storms and the rising and falling of seas. It's amazing there's anything left for you to go looking at to, to figure out. It's amazing there's one mummy left after all of this, but there are. There, there are. So. Yeah, it's, it's the fun of archaeology. Yep. Good. Ed, genuinely a pleasure. So uh, again, Ed has this wonderful Mayan calendar with beautiful photos and the day counts in it. And um, one to the, the next 20 people who give any monthly donation uh, that you know, put the, we'll put the link up and then um, we will also, uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm going to do what I can to um, get, get the, get the word out about this uh, publication. Well, of yours. Thank you. I appreciate it. You know, I do it mostly for love. I just, uh, I, it's a very small little business, but I'm always happy to share it with people, especially your audience who's so interested in looking at time in different ways. I feel like there are illegitimate sources of Maya wisdom out there. And I, as sincerely as I can, am just communicating what, what I know from real Maya people. Yeah. And I, and, and you, you're placing something in a contemporary context that's actually current uh, rather than say, for example, a history a book about it. It's a useful object. It's a useful thing. Yeah, and and we are we are keeping it alive, which you know, cultural diversity is under assault these days. This is this is my little part. Yes, good. <laughs> All right. So uh, till till next time, I guess I'll be seeing you in like uh, episode twenty six of uh, of the South America series. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll see you then. <laughs> Wonderful. And that, by the way, is in great courses. Just type in Ed Barnhart. Um, and it's, uh, I highly recommend great courses. It's they, they've got a new thing that they've turned into. They've, they've turned into something called Wonderum. And it's one of those channels you can get on your Roku box or however you get those. Like if you get Netflix and Amazon and Hulu and all those as a channel. Now there's one called Wonderum where you can see their entire huge corpus for a monthly fee, just like all those other little channels. Yeah, and it's really worth it now that now that you have to go to Harvard on Zoom uh, for seventy five thousand dollars a year. This is a lot cheaper than going to Harvard on Zoom <laughs> for seventy five thousand dollars a year. It's like fifteen dollars a a month. And I and um, since killing my uh, commercial television, um, after I realized it, it not only had no actual information value, but it lost all of its kind of archaeology value. Also, I killed that and like. This is amazing. They definitely know their stuff. They hire great people. And the, I can tell you by going through the process, they have a very rigorous system of verifying everything that comes out. I have, I have never been so scrutinized and judged in my entire life. Everything I say on those courses is, is vetted by a whole team of people who, who try to prove me wrong at every turn. That is interesting. Well, I'm it, glad it to hear that. I, I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that because um. I've learned a lot from them and, and uh, continue to do so. All right. Once again, thank you very much. We'll link your podcast. We'll link Mayan-Calendar.com and um, click on that. Uh, sign, don donate to Chiron Return, Planet Waves FM. And uh, you'll, you will have one of Ed's calendars in your hands uh, in probably in about two weeks because we've got to order them today. I'll, I'll call you in a second when we're off of the Zoom call and uh, give you a card number, and uh, I, I'm I'm thrilled to know you, and that you're doing the work that you're doing, uh, and that you're an accessible, down to earth guy. Uh, it's it's a great pleasure. I I so 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 uh, well, hearts open, hats off. Fun. Invite me again sometime. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Good. I'll have other questions once I formulate them, and maybe more specific uh, topics, or even specific areas, or re, you know re regions, or what you're doing next or what, whatever, including expeditions. If you're still leading them, happy to, um, ha happy to, I am and I'd happy be to happy pitch to those to your community. Good. Well, it was a pleasure. Fun to talk to you. Ed, thank you.